All right, welcome to Just One Thing. In today's edition, I'm going to talk about what is Windows Azure. My name is Adam Graholsky, and I'm a technical evangelist with RBA Consulting. In order to understand Azure, we need to kind of put it into perspective of the three commonly accepted cloud models. Uh, first, we have infrastructure as a service, which is almost a standard hosting model. Platform as service, where you build applications or solutions upon a platform provided by a vendor. And then there's software as a service, where you consume a product from a vendor. So in that case, something like Office 365. Windows Azure falls into the platform as a service model, where Microsoft provides you with a platform, everything from networking and infrastructure to supported operating systems, middlewares, and runtimes that you can then target your applications to run upon. The platform itself is actually composed of three pillars, three main components. The first of which is Windows Azure, which is kind of your operating system for the cloud. It's a little more than just an operating system, and we'll look at those components momentarily. We then have Windows Azure App Fabric. This is a middleware platform where you've got things like caching and service bus. We'll also dive into those details momentarily. Finally, SQL Azure, so database and BI needs are met by the SQL Azure platform. We'll talk a little bit about those as well. So let's take a look at the various components of Windows Azure itself. First is compute. Now this is really the operating system in the cloud, if, if you want to think about it that way. The compute component of Windows Azure enables you to host websites and web services, ASP.NET sites, ASP.NET MVC sites. You can certainly host Silverlight applications. You can also run non.NET apps as well. If you run PHP, you can certainly do PHP or Java in the cloud too. And all of that is handled in compute. You also have, um, those are public facing web roles or websites. You can also have backend processing or batch jobs like Windows services to do um, processor intensive tasks. Maybe you do, you analyze insurance data. Maybe you need to do video encoding things that take a lot of compute cycles. You can certainly run those up in the cloud as well. You then have virtual machines. Uh, you can actually upload your own custom Windows Server 2008 R2 images to the cloud and completely control the VM that's running in the cloud. You then have some storage components. So and actually, Windows Azure gives you durable storage in the cloud via four different mechanisms. You have tables, which is confusing because tables in Windows Azure is not the same thing as a table in SQL. It's non-relational. It's, it's more of an entity-based model, um, and, or no SQL, if you will. You then have blobs. So blob storage in the cloud allows you to store in media files, uh, spreadsheets, photos, videos, whatever. And you can also secure that as well. You have queues for messaging in the cloud. So think MSNQ, but in this case, we're actually running a queuing service in the cloud. And finally, you have something that's called Windows Azure Drives. And a drive enables you to take an NTFS mountable volume, store that up in the cloud, and then mount it in your various compute and virtual machine instances. That way, you, those roles and those instances can write to a disk that's durably stored. So if the instance goes down or gets moved around by a fabric controller um, due to maybe some networking or hardware issues, the data that you're saving will still be there when it starts up again. Uh, along with storage, you have something called the content delivery network, and this applies specifically to blob storage. Take uh, the instance where you create a website and you're streaming a lot of video. When you create a storage account, you specify where you want that data stored. So you choose one of the data centers. For example, uh, I'm in Minneapolis, so I would probably choose the North Central Data Center, which I know happens to be located in Chicago, which is great if I've got customers close to Chicago, but say my website does really well, it gets a lot of traffic, and all of a sudden I'm seeing huge traffic coming in from Australia. Well, that means to get to my content, they need to get all the way over to Chicago and back. So I'm gonna, in, they're going to encounter some latency there. What I can do is I can enable the CDN, the Content Delivery Network, so that when requests come in, say somewhere from Australia, that request will actually go to a, uh, an edge server first. An edge server is a server that's actually closer to the client than the than the data center in Chicago. If the content isn't already on the edge server, the client will get routed to Chicago to pull that to pull the data down, but that data will then get cached or stored on the edge server. So a subsequent requests come in for that content, they'll actually just hit that edge server in Australia rather than having to go all the way to Chicago. So I get to reduce my latency that way.
And finally, there's a component called virtual networking. This is a, a fairly new component, and all of its bits are in CTP at the moment, so they're not considered production ready. But this gives you the advantage of a couple of things. Uh, the biggest one is Windows Azure Connect. Um, enables you to connect your on-premises resources with your Azure resources so that you can create a virtual network between the cloud and your on-premise data center. Um, that way you can move bits and pieces of applications to the cloud that may have requirements that you um, on other resources that have to reside in your data center or aren't ready to move to the cloud. Next up is Windows Azure App Fabric. Now there's three components to this we'll touch on lightly. First is the service bus, um, and this has actually undergone a number of different names. First it was BizTalk Services, then it was .NET Services, but now it's Windows Azure App Fabric Service Bus. If you're used to using a technology like BizTalk for an enterprise service bus, that's exactly what this is, it's, but it's service bus at cloud scale. It enables some very interesting scenarios, uh, especially among business partners. It enables them to connect uh, no matter what their network topologies are. One of the biggest problems when you're dealing with partners and connections is dealing with the fact that their machines and services and your machines and services are sitting behind different firewalls and you've got NATs and all kinds of things in the middle of the connection that can make connecting very difficult. The service bus eases that process. The, the Windows Azure App Fabric service bus can can do that network traversal can get through those firewalls to get to get two partners connected. Now there's two ways it can happen kind of at a very high level. First is kind of a, a relayed connection or brokered connection where every time partner A wants to connect to partner B that connection actually goes up to the service bus and then down to partner B from partner A and vice versa. So it's kind of a there, there could be a potential latency issue there. But that but the service bus is actually smart enough to know looking at the network topologies of the various partners involved in a connection to say hey you guys can actually connect directly so I'm gonna make that direct connection for you that way latency gets reduced. But you can have it also monitor the connection as well if for some reason there's some change in network topology the service bus can say okay wait a minute something's changed I'm gonna go back to that more brokered model where all all connections actually have to go through the service bus first rather than going directly to one another. You then have the access control service. This enables you to secure your applications that are running in the cloud. Security is one of those things I always like to say. It's kind of like flossing your teeth, right? Nobody really likes or gets excited about it, except you know maybe my mom who is a dental hygienist. But it's one of those things, especially as a developer, that you know you need to do. Security is really important, especially running in the cloud you know, security is going to be top of mind. The access control service makes it very simple to integrate uh, with a number of different security mechanisms, one of which is Active Directory Federation services. If you're running Active Directory and ADFS on-prem, you can federate with the cloud so you can secure your applications that are running in the cloud with your on-prem Active Directory. If, you're so, if you don't have Active Directory or perhaps your solution doesn't require Active Directory but you still want to secure it, there are other me mechanisms as well to allow third parties to secure your applications via access control. You can use web identity providers such as Windows Live, Facebook, Google, and Yahoo at this point in time, or you can actually roll your own as well. So that way you can make sure your applications uh, are, are safe and secure. And finally, in, in the latest addition to that fabric is the caching service. One of the ways to create really great applications is is to create applications that are fast or that appear to be fast. And one of the ways you do that, especially kind of in a web environment, is through caching. That way your applications don't always have to go directly to the data source to get commonly accessed data. That data can be stored in a cache. A cloud environment, caching is a little bit different in that you don't want to cache directly on the hardware. So what caching does is gives you a distributed in-memory cache that goes across all instances of a given of a given website or worker role, whatever you're running. That way you get great performance all the time, but it, it, it's a caching service, so that way you don't have to worry about managing your own cache. Finally, last component is SQL Azure. So obviously when you think SQL, you think relational database, and that's exactly what SQL Azure is. However, when you buy a SQL Azure database, it, I believe it's $9.99 per gig per month, you're not actually getting one database. You get three transactionally consistent databases. To your applications, it looks like one database. It just looks like a typical you know, SQL connection string, SQL endpoint. But what that endpoint really is, is a gateway into three databases. That way, you know, if hardware goes down, servers fail, whatever happens, 
you've got three different databases running on different servers, so at any point if one goes down, we can easily spin up another one from one of the copies we have. And that's just, and what's amazing about that is that it's included in that price. Doing that on your own on-premise solution, not very easy or cost efficient to do. And lastly, and this feature is in CTP, but one of the biggest requests um, that came from SQL Azure when it was first released was the request for business intelligence or reporting services. It's great to have relational data in the cloud, but if you can't report on it, it doesn't do you a whole lot of good. Now, you could stand up in the past SQL Server reporting services on-prem and have that point to a database, a SQL Azure database, but there's kind of a disconnect there. It Wouldn't it be better if you could actually just have those reports running in the cloud as well? Well, now you can with the reporting services feature that's part of SQL Azure. As I said, that feature is currently in CTP, but it should be going into production sometime by the end of the year. And that's it. So we just walked through about kind of the 10 or the kind of the three pillars of Windows Azure as well as kind of their various components, 10 and all. Um, in the next episode, we'll actually start looking at what it takes to begin development uh, on the Azure platform.